Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Parker Nierenstein. This is Vehicle Virgins. If you're new to the channel, smash that subscribe button to join the family. Behind me is an S63 that Mercedes gave me. Now, why is it an S63 and not an E63? Well, I flew out to Germany to do European delivery of my E63, and I've been told it's not ready yet. So we're gonna go back to the facility, ask them what's up, and then take a tour of the rest of the town. I just got passed by a police officer that is in a Mercedes E-Class wagon. How crazy is that? It is so cool driving on German roads. All the signs are obviously completely different, but the one thing that I've noticed is they are so smooth. Just showed up once again at Porsche. We're going to the museum now because my dad is a total Porsche fanatic. Awesome lineup of Porsches just in the garage. We've got a GT3 here. The interesting part is it has Turbo S wheels. And then we have a GT3 RS here, and then another GT3 with more normal spec wheels, and a giant range of Porsches. Then of course, this beautiful S63. Just got to the Porsche Museum. There's only like five minutes left till it closes. They tell us we have to be out super fast. My dad has just hurt his back. There's only stairs available. I mean, that's like 150 sets of stairs. This totally sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the Porsche 917 is one of my all time favorite cars and they have not just one in golf livery, but four different 917s. This is a 917. That's a 917 KH. I haven't actually heard of the KH before. This is a 917 20 and then another 917 in the back there. These cars have massive flat 12 engines and some of them have upwards of a thousand horsepower. Yeah, so one of the things you can see about these cars, whether it's the 917s or even 962s, they had to have passenger seats, they had to have working headlights, working taillights, because these were driven 24 hours at Le Mans, so there were requirements that were instilled to make sure that these cars could drive at night. And in order to be homologated, they had to have certain things that a streetcar would have. And they're all right-hand drive in this and lineup, right, at least. Yeah, That's crazy. I didn't know. I didn't realize that. 956 race car, upside down. 924. And one of my other all-time favorites, a Porsche 959. That is savage. Now the 996 generation doesn't get a lot of love, but in GT2 form, that actually looks fantastic. The museum is closing, but last but not least, my current favorite Porsche, the GT2 RS. I actually got to see a bunch of these be built the other day on the line when Shmi was taking delivery of his GT3. And of course behind that, the 918 Spider. Another stunning GT2 RS. Of the five or so GT2 RSs I saw get built on the line yesterday, almost all of them were red. Seems like the most popular color choice for the car. Well, unfortunately, due to a ton of traffic, we showed up super late and got all of five minutes in the museum. So I apologize for that super quick rush tour, but oh my gosh, spectacular, the display they had. And I definitely need to come back and spend some more time with the cars. All right, so what was your favorite car at the Porsche Museum? Uh, that would have to be the two Gulf livery 9s. 17s. Derek Bell driving one of them and Jackie Ix, Joe Siffert driving the other car, Pedro Rodriguez, awesome Le Mans wins. I think that car, the F40, and then a road legal Sesto Elemento would be my top three cars of all time. Yeah, Freaking awesome. Go. Just had a long talk with management at the European Delivery Center. We're trying to come up with a creative solution to solve this pretty interesting situation. I'll keep you guys posted. I don't know what's gonna happen, but stay tuned. I'm on a website right now trying to find information about where the de-restricted sections of the Autobahn are. I found out that this is the sign we are looking for, this white sign with slashes through it in black that say that is the end of all speed and passing limits. We're gonna locate that now, given the fact that we are are in an AMG with a twin turbo V8. I think we could probably take this thing pretty quick. Just found a section of road called Highway A8. Actually, it's probably not called Highway whatsoever. Autobahn A8, whatever it's called, it's de-restricted. We're gonna check it out and see how fast this thing goes. Oh good, we've got a start on Kas Brunlestras. Because this S-Class is a 16, it doesn't have that progressive display, but it still looks really cool. I've got AMG mode activated so you can see a picture of the S63, traction controls on, comfort mode in the suspension, and maps with a bunch of words I don't understand. 
Look at this, so before there was no cars, in America you would think that this dashed line would just signify that there's another lane in the same direction, but here, <laughs> there's cars coming in the opposite direction. There we go, there's a divider. All right guys, we are on A8, and as you can see on the dash, it has that no speed limit sign. This is exciting. Unfortunately, there is a lot of traffic, so I don't know if this is possible, but we'll find out. All right, this is crazy. So we went here to drive on the Autobahn, top this thing out, and up ahead is the brand new, all electric, hasn't come out yet, Porsche Mission E. This is the competitor to the Tesla Model S. There's not that much data on it, but we can see a test mule up ahead. I'll try to get next to it. <laughs> this is exciting. Check this thing out, guys. That is sick. It's in partial camo. We just saw that Mission E briefly. I'm sorry I didn't get a better look at that, but that was cool to see in person. Let's see, it's crazy to have up on my dash and the heads up display that there's no speed limit right here. Well, this is certainly hideous. <laughs> an Evoke convertible. SUV convertibles, that is an interesting style of vehicle, that's for sure. We're now going the opposite direction because there was far too much traffic. Ooh, awesome Audi TT. There's quite a lot of traffic. So 155, something I learned from Shmi. I thought it was kind of a random, arbitrary number, 155 miles an hour, that they limit almost all German cars to in the United States. Why would it be 155? Not, why not 150 or 160? 155 is actually 250 kilometers an hour. So that's much more of a round number, makes sense. Certainly nowhere close to the limit, but right now I'm legally going 220 kilometers per hour. That's pretty cool. I'm at the limit, 257, pedal to the floor. That's all it'll go, all right. So there you have it. I guess this car is limited to 155 miles an hour, but I just flat out went 155 legally on the freeway with no worry in the world that I was gonna get pulled over and thrown in jail. I mean, if you got caught by the cops going 155 in the US, say goodbye to your driver's license. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. What's the secret to making a good thumbnail on YouTube, Dad? <laughs> You know what you just exposed yourself to? <laughs> oh no, the photoshopping that's just been done. I was just taking a thumbnail picture for this video while he was taking it, and then he asked, oh, was it a mouth open shot? It's always a mouth open shot, Dad. Well, we have found out that bumper to bumper traffic is not just on the 405 in Southern California. This traffic, especially on the other side, is absolutely brutal. Thankfully, I was able to do that top speed run right before it's become absolutely impossible to do so. 155 miles an hour legally in Germany on the Autobahn in a Mercedes AMG vehicle. That is a highlight for sure. That I'm never going to forget. Back upstairs after hitting the top speed in the S63 on the Autobahn, let's go ahead and head up to the hotel. Back at the room, it's funny, it's been such a fantastic time in Germany and at the same time a really crushing experience. Still trying to work out what we're gonna do in regards to my new E63. Obviously the entire point of this trip coming to Germany was to take that car and I had all this stuff planned for you guys to drive it on the Autobahn, to drive it on a track in Belgium. I was going to take it to the Nürburgring and while the Nürburgring is closed, there was another YouTuber there who was going to give me a tour, but all these things can't really happen. I can't just take a rental car out on the track, unfortunately. That being said, being here in Germany, seeing the museums, going to the Porsche Museum, I'm a huge Porsche fan myself, as well as my dad who's an even larger larger Porsche fan has been incredible. Seeing Schmi 150, meeting him for the first time, getting to see the factory, going to Alfalterbach, going to the Porsche assembly line, doing all these things has been a really, really cool experience. I think I'm gonna end this video by doing a little bit more of a Q&A. You guys asked so many questions on my Instagram right here, at Vehicle Virgins. If you ever have any questions, whatever, leave them on my Instagram, at Vehicle Virgins. I wanna do some more Q&As. Let's go ahead, jump right in. All right, some Q&A. First question, why did you name your channel Vehicle Virgins? Obviously, I've answered this a bunch. I'll do it again, Vehicle Virgins, Virgin, 
first time, it was all about first time car buying. I was helping high school and college students find their first car back in 2011 when I came up with the concept of vehicle versions. Then in 2013, I developed the YouTube channel because I thought it was easier to find an audience on YouTube where people were already present as opposed to a standalone website that I had developed prior to that. Obviously, it's advanced a bit since then, but Virgins is about first time car buying. What was your first car? A lot of people don't know. My first car was a 2006 BMW 330i. It was the only 330i of the E90 generation. Then they switched to the 328i and the 335i, which was the twin turbo, much cooler version that I wanted so badly, but that wasn't gonna happen for many reasons. If you could only buy vehicles from one manufacturer for the rest of your life, which would it be? That's really, really hard, but but if I had to make a random decision without thinking about it too much, uh, you can't get this totally right. I mean, I could switch my answer a million times. I'd probably go with Porsche because they've got everything from a practical SUV, a nice sedan, all the way up to a hypercar, and then there's the supercar category, a fun driver's car, and they make vehicles with a manual, etc. Also, Lamborghini coming out with the SUV, that makes a good case for itself. I would love to have a Urus. I think eventually that's definitely a future car that I'd love to have on the channel and in my garage. When you were buying the Huracan, did you have any thoughts about buying an Aventador instead of a Huracan? And if so, what made you choose the Huracan over the Aventador? That's a really good question. So when I was considering buying the Huracan, I absolutely did think about an Aventador. Used Aventadors at the time, uh, if you got a higher mileage, first year one was about $290,000, whereas the Huracans were uh, 220 to 250. The biggest reason for the Huracan was significantly lighter weight. So the US spec Aventador is 4,100 pounds. The US spec Huracan is 3,350 pounds. So that makes a massive difference in terms of drivability. Also, probably the number one reason is transmission. The double clutch in the Huracan responds so fast and it's also daily drivable, whereas the Aventador is single clutch. Another thing is, although the Aventador looks cooler, sounds cooler, has the doors, getting one of the first year models out of warranty with the single clutch it seemed like it was a recipe for a disaster in terms of maintenance. Now, that being said, having owned a Huracan for a long time, especially after supercharging it, I very much don't regret the decision. I'd still rather have the driving experience of a Huracan more than a brand new Aventador S. Now, I still don't deny the Aventador looks, sounds cooler, but driving experience wise, if you took that aside, Huracan all the way. This is a good question. Here's a good question from Alex Felipe, I'm gonna hold you to this. I'll subscribe to your website for a year if you answer this question, dogs or cats? Uh, I hate cats, I'm super allergic to them, so definitely dogs. And uh, last real question, did you ever consider buying a Nissan GTR, an R35? Absolutely, especially when I had the Gallardo and would race people, I had a lot of friends with R35 GTRs. You buy a 2009, 2010 GTR for 45 to 60 grand, and then you spend 10K making it full bolt-on, and it would absolutely destroy most cars on the road. So it was absolutely tempting thinking about how for a relatively affordable package, you could have a super fast car. At the end of the day, the GTR wasn't quite in line with what I wanted. It's not that refined. I don't like the interior. I don't actually really like the way it looks whatsoever, but I do respect the fact, especially when it came out originally, how much of a performance bargain it truly was. Nowadays, with a Nismo GTR costing $180,000, it really isn't that performance bargain anymore. I mean, you can get a slightly used LP580 or an RAV10 Plus or a McLaren 570S, all of which I'd rather have than a Nismo GTR. All right, well, I think that's a perfect time to end the video. If you're not subscribed yet, smash that subscribe button. If you enjoyed me hitting 155 miles an hour legally on the Autobahn, hit that thumbs up button. I look forward to seeing you next video.